English listening. Topic 1. Booking a hotel. Good afternoon. You're through to reception at the Island Hotel in Crete. How may I help you today? Yes, hello there. I'm hoping to book a double room for my wife and myself for about two weeks from the 25th of April of this year. Firstly, could you tell me whether it's particularly hot during this time? Yes, of course, sir. During late April and early May, the daytime temperature shouldn't exceed 19 degrees Celsius. But the weather has been rather erratic and difficult to predict in recent years, so I am unable to say for certain. OK, that sounds good. My wife doesn't like going outside when it's very hot. I haven't booked flights yet, but I must say that I'm unfamiliar with Crete and its transport system. Does the hotel provide an airport shuttle service? Yes, sir. We provide a complimentary airport pickup service for all our guests. It takes about 40 minutes to get here from the airport, but it's at least 60 minutes at rush hours. And you will be provided with a fully air-conditioned shuttle bus. OK, excellent. In that case, do you have any rooms available for the dates I gave you? I shall have a look on the system now for you, sir. Bear with me just a moment. Yes, sir. I can see now that we have several rooms available. Would you prefer a garden view or a sea view? Well, ideally, I would like a sea view room with a balcony. But of course, that depends on the difference in price. Not to worry, sir. All of our standard double rooms have ensuite facilities and a balcony. If you would like one of our sea view rooms, there is a premium of 60 euros per night. OK. So, could you tell me the total nightly rate for a standard double room with a sea view? Yes, of course, sir. For the spring months, our rate is 216 euros per night. For 14 nights altogether, this will come to 3,024 euros. Perfect. I also read on your website that the hotel has gym and spa facilities. Are there any other facilities on offer? Yes. We have a large outdoor infinity pool overlooking the ocean, with luxury sunbeds and a poolside bar. We also have three full-size tennis courts, where we run a popular doubles tournament, with the winner receiving two all-inclusive spa day vouchers. Goodness, I shall have to brush up on my tennis skills. Are there any other activities organised by the hotel that we can partake in? It's just that it's our wedding anniversary on the 30th of June, and I would like to provide my wife with a perfect romantic getaway. I can assure you, sir, that your wife won't be disappointed. Ours is a five-star resort, which is renowned for its luxury and beauty. In terms of activities, the hotel provides thrice-weekly entertainment. On Tuesdays, guests will take a minibus and partake in learning to cook succulent fish dishes with our Michelin-starred chef, Enrique. The class will take place in a beautiful valley deep in the Cretan Hills, where guests will be treated to an intimate piano performance by our in-house concert pianist, Pedro. On Wednesdays, a select number of guests will be fortunate enough to explore the mountains by helicopter, before being transported to a tropical Cretan garden by shuttle bus. Finally, on Thursdays, after a fancy dinner, we provide a spectacular fireworks display, which guests can view from the comfort of a cable car. Oh, wow. That all sounds absolutely wonderful. I shall book the room now, and then I need to look at flights so as not to become extortionate. Would you like to take my details now or later? Topic 2. An overview of the online exchange business. Barter Online UK is a young, up-and-coming website in the United Kingdom where users can buy new and used goods. However, instead of paying with money, registered users instead exchange their purchase for an item of similar value. 
This part is perhaps the most complicated, as the registered users themselves must mutually decide on an appropriate value, with value either being the recommended retail price, RRP, or simply how much they believe the item to be worth. The website has been founded by a group of four friends in the north of England. Originally, they exchanged their belongings among family members. They frequently found themselves swapping their belongings when they no longer had any use for them. They live by the motto, one person's trash is another person's treasure, and hate to throw things away. As more and more people caught wind of the idea and wanted to participate in the exchanges, the group decided that the idea had the potential to become a successful business venture, and so it did. Barter Online UK is a startup online business, which took three months to set up, and has now been running for around half a year. Despite only being founded a short time ago, the website has already garnered about 1,500 registered users, with 500 more than expected, a huge achievement for the founders. Some of the users are registered in the United Kingdom and Canada, with the majority from the Republic of Ireland. In order to become a registered member, users must first fill in their personal details, followed by their credit or debit card details, which will be used to take payment of a monthly fee of £5. As long as this fee is paid, users will be able to perform an unlimited number of online exchanges. A multitude of items are sold on the website, such as textbooks, soft toys and tools. However, books for children and computer games are by far selected most. The exchange process itself is not as complicated as it might seem. Users can enter their preferences for what they would like to receive, and also explicitly state what they would like to give away, and the website will automatically pair up suitable users. If, however, a user doesn't want to give anything away, but would simply like to buy something, Barter Online UK does support a secure online payment system, where users can perform a normal monetary transaction. Despite this, the founding group strongly discourages the use of the online payment system, clearly stating that this goes against the intended ethos of the company. Although bartering is an age-old process, Many of the website's users are unsure how to decide which of their own items to exchange. It often helps to order items by popularity using the filter button provided. This will tell the website to find out popular items for users' convenience. To this, the founding members say, just put everything you don't want on there. Different people have different tastes and you never know what they might be looking for. In order to aid registered users in their exchanges and to provide them with assurance, the founders recently added a new feature whereby on completion of an exchange, users will be encouraged to provide each other with feedback. This feedback will include criteria such as the quality of the item as compared with how it was advertised, the ease of communication with the seller, the speed at which the item was delivered and so on. The friends believe that using this method, users will have a more transparent and trustworthy bartering experience. Topic 3. Talking about reflective journal assignment. Professor Tomlinson, may Annie and I please quickly ask you a few questions about the reflective journal assignment? It's just that we're a bit confused as to what you want us to include and discuss. Yes, of course. What are you having trouble with? Well, everything really. To start with, what should be included first in the reflective journal? Perhaps suggestions from others? No, no. Firstly, you should include the study goals you set yourself at the beginning of the module. 
This section should have been discussed in some detail towards the beginning of the course by Professor May. You should be able to find her suggestions on the slides she has provided the class online. OK, thank you, Professor. Could I also trouble you to take a brief look at my bibliography and footnotes? I feel like they're missing something. Most of our friends' bibliographies are longer. Well, looking at this, Annie, I can see that you have used a wide range of resources, which shows that you have made effective use of communication technology. As far as I can tell, you need not make any changes to this, although you might want to double-check that your referencing complies with the Harvard Referencing Style regulations. Oh, I'm very surprised you've said that. Thank you. Now I can set my mind at ease. Tom, you said you wanted to ask the professor about the achievements section. Ah, yes, professor. In the assignment guidelines, we are asked to introduce and elaborate on our biggest achievement in the past, saying which skills we learned in the process and how these skills can be transferred to various different future careers. The only problem is that I don't know what my greatest achievement actually is. I've only ever worked as a waiter in a hotel restaurant during the summer holidays from university. If you worked as a waiter in a hotel restaurant, you're bound to have worked with other waiters as part of a team. Would you say that during your time as a waiter, you developed any leadership skills? Yes, well, I suppose I was asked to become the team leader of the food and beverage department, but that's hardly an achievement. You might not think so. But if you write that you were offered the position of the team leader, it shows a lot more about your character. For example, that you're charismatic and work well in a high-pressure situation. I never would have thought to write that down. Thank you. I guess I should start listening to others more often. Annie, do you have any more questions or are you ready to go back to the library? Yeah, I think I've got everything I need. Thank you very much, Professor Tomlinson. That was really helpful. I'm actually starting to look forward to writing this now, and it should be a really useful exercise to prepare us for writing CVs and applying for jobs. It's shocking how bad I am at identifying my strengths and weaknesses. Professor Tomlinson has shown me that I definitely need to start displaying some self-awareness. Yeah, Tom, you really do. You're always so modest. Modesty is great until it comes to applying for jobs. Oh no! I forgot to ask the professor about the section on identifying the skills gained through different activities. Do you remember? When it asks you, for example, whether writing an essay develops your study skills or your independent learning and so on. Oh goodness! We really should have asked him that. I've been having trouble with it too. It just seems like such a pointless task. What do you reckon the answers are? Hmm, I think writing an essay might be a way of identifying and resolving a problem, because you have to state the problem in the introduction and then solve it. I'm not so sure about taking exams. I thought they were supposed to develop lots of different skill sets. If I really had to choose, I'd say that taking exams enables you to become more confident in yourself. Do you agree? Maybe. I really don't know either. What do you think about the last two? Making class notes and presentation notes? Oh, it's so difficult. I think making class notes has to be a way of becoming a more independent learner, because you yourself decide what the important information is and learn it. That reminds me, I find taking presentation notes is a disaster. The professors speak much too quickly and I write much too slowly. Topic 4 Chimpanzee Behaviours Welcome back to my series of short lectures on apes. Today we will examine recent and historical breakthroughs on the behavior of chimpanzees, otherwise known as chimps. The word chimpanzee is an umbrella term for two different species of apes in the genus Pan, 
which are the common chimpanzee or pan troglodytes found in West and Central Africa, and the bonobo or pan paniscus, which are found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees belong to the hominidae family, together with gorillas, orangutans, and indeed humans. Current research tells us that the chimps broke away from the human branch of the hominidae family approximately six million years ago and remain the closest living relative to humans to this day. More modern researchers into chimpanzees have centered on their behavioral characteristics once all biological and genetic factors have been ruled out. In this way, scientists have unearthed an unfathomable amount of similarities between human and chimpanzee behavior. Although much of this research has taken place through observation of captive chimps, the results are widely seen as an authoritative reflection of chimps living in the wild. Chimps live in large so-called communities comprised of many male and female members, with the social hierarchy determined by an individual chimp's position and influence. Through such research, scientists have found that chimps learn and adapt through observation of others' behavior. Once in power, the alpha male is often seen to alter its body language in order to retain power. For example, he might puff himself up in order to intimidate others, while lower-ranking chimps are noted to behave more submissively and holding out their hands while grunting. Female chimpanzees also have a distinct social hierarchy, with high social standing inherited by children. It is not unheard of for dominant females within a community to unite and overthrow the alpha male, backing another in his place. James Diamond, in his book The Third Chimpanzee, suggests that chimps should now be reclassified in the genus Homo instead of Pan, and there are many arguments still in favor of this. Male common chimpanzees are, on average, 1.7 meters in height, weighing 70 kilograms, with their female counterparts being somewhat smaller. By comparison, the bonobo is slightly shorter and lighter, but with longer arms and legs. However, both species walk on all fours and climb trees with great ease. Jane Goodall made a groundbreaking discovery in 1960 when she observed the use of tools among chimpanzees, including digging for termites with large sticks. A recent study claimed to reveal that common chimpanzees in Senegal have been using spears sharpened with their teeth to hunt. However, these reports remain unsubstantiated. Researchers have witnessed such tools, namely rocks, being used by chimps to open coconut shells and indeed crushing nuts with stone hammers. As scientific technology has developed, so too has our knowledge of the sheer extent of the chimp's intelligence. Research has now shown that chimps have the capability to learn and use symbols and understand aspects of the human language including syntax, as well as numerical sequences. As I mentioned earlier, the umbrella term chimpanzee is comprised of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. These two subspecies are divided along the Congo River, with the common chimps living on one side and the bonobos living on the opposite side of the river. Over the past few decades, both of these subspecies have witnessed an alarming decrease in population density, with animal activists now working harder than ever to protect those remaining and encourage procreation. In addition, next week's episode will focus more closely on how chimpanzees in captivity are able to learn things through imitating the behavior of humans, as well as how chimpanzees' behaviors have developed over many generations. Thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture. I hope you found it intellectually stimulating, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night.
Topic 5. Inquiring about the automobile exhibition. Good morning. You're through to the events coordinator at the Birmingham City Council. How may I help you? Hello there. My husband and I are interested in purchasing tickets to the automobile exhibition, but I couldn't find many details about it on your website, and I was wondering whether you could provide me with some more information. Does it open in June? Yes, of course, madam. The exhibition will take place during July and will showcase the history of automobiles from the very first commercial car in the late 1800s all the way through to the present day. Is the exhibition open for the duration of July? No, madam. The exhibition will last three days, from the 1st of July to the 3rd of July, and then the cars will be taken to another exhibition. OK. Does the exhibition focus on a certain manufacturer? No. It will showcase a wide range of manufacturers. Wonderful. I'm ever so fed up of going to these shows and only seeing one manufacturer. Are there any opportunities to sit in or even drive the cars? There will be many opportunities for you to sit in the cars. However, some of the cars will only be available to observe. We are yet to be told whether any of the antique cars will be available to drive. However, there will certainly be an opportunity to test driving some of the more modern cars on a purpose-built track. That sounds like great fun. I mustn't forget to bring my camera or my husband will never forgive me. I'm afraid to say that cameras are actually strictly not allowed to bring into the exhibition. There will, however, be a section where a professional photographer will be available to take photos of you sitting in a car in period clothing. Well, that sounds like it could be fun, but I assume the photos won't be free. On the contrary, one free photograph is included within every ticket, but each photo after this will cost £5. That's a nice surprise. Not many things are free anymore. I've been asking around about the ticket prices, but I haven't yet had a definite answer. Is it correct that the tickets are £100, whether you buy them now or on arrival? I'm afraid not. If you buy the ticket in advance, the price is £110, but it's £165 on the door. Oh goodness, I suppose I'd best pay for them now then. Is it possible to buy tickets from you now over the phone? Yes, of course, madam. I'll transfer you to the box office manager, Mark Edgeworth. That's E-D-G-E-W-O-R-T-H. And he will probably need to take your credit card details and some personal details. Yes, that's fine. Before you transfer me, I just need to ask a few more questions. Will the exhibition be held in the Birmingham Exhibition Centre? I think that's where I went last time. No, madam. The Birmingham Exhibition Centre is currently undergoing some renovations. So this year, all exhibitions will be held in the Summer Palace. Summer Palace? I'm not entirely sure where that is. Well, it's not too far from City Centre. Once you're in the centre, you should be able to find signs for the palace. If not, most people in Birmingham will be able to direct you. Mm, neither my husband nor I am particularly good with directions. Is there anywhere I can find this information on the internet? Our website will give you an address. Perhaps you could visit www.directions.com for more detailed information, and they should be able to provide you with step-by-step -step instructions. OK. And is this the best way to contact you, by phone? I think the most convenient way to contact us is inquiring online, which is much simpler than having to dial various different numbers to reach the right person. Unless you have any more questions, I'll transfer you now. No, that's great. Thank you for your help. Topic 6. An Introduction to the Medical Care Centre Hello and welcome to the homepage for the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. 
where we'd like to share a little more information about the services we provide and more. Our hospital is one of the leading specialised hospitals in the United Kingdom, attracting the very best healthcare professionals from around the globe. Not only are we a leading medical practice, but we are also the only hospital in the United Kingdom dedicated entirely to the treatment of and research into the curing of hearing loss. Our facilities and staff here are renowned across Europe, attracting thousands of patients a year. Our consultations can number anything up to 11,000 patients a year. However, we aim to treat around 5,000 patients a year so as to maintain and ensure the quality of our services. Our patients are guaranteed the highest standard of care, as well as the use of our first-class facilities. All patients requiring overnight treatment are provided with their own private room with ensuite facilities, as well as a state-of-the-art entertainment centre, which includes a flat-screen LCD television and PlayStation. Appointments with our healthcare professionals can be made at any time during the week, with female doctors available between 8am and 11am. If you need to see a doctor outside of these times, please visit the Out of Hours page of our website for more information. Our doctors are all trained to an exceptionally high standard and practice a vast array of specialities. Mr. Roberts is a fully qualified ear and throat specialist. Mr. Edwards is a paediatric hearing specialist while Mr. Green specialises in reversing hearing loss. For more details about our people, please visit the staff members page on our website. During a consultation, doctors will sometimes decide medication is required, for which patients should receive a prescription. There are several pharmacies within the city, however, we recommend that patients use the pharmacy housed within our healthcare facility. Our in-house pharmacy is well stocked at all times. Our products are competitively priced and our pharmacists are on hand to help and advise from 8am until 10pm from Monday to Saturday and from 9am until 12pm on Sundays. If you require any help outside of these hours, please see our Out of Hours page on the website. Since the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery also functions as a teaching hospital, we aim to provide our students with every opportunity to expose themselves to medicine in practice. Therefore, we would like to encourage our patients to give their consent for a medical student to attend their consultations. If our patients are not comfortable with this, there will be a form at reception where patients will be able to opt out. Now, please look at the map I've given you of the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. For those not familiar with our practice, reception can be found through the main door at the end of the corridor. If your consultation is booked with Mr. Green, you need to go through the main door and turn right by the nurse's desk and his office is at the end of the corridor on your left-hand side. If you need to alter any of your personal details, please visit our secretary at the Office for Medical Records, which you will find next to the therapy room. If you're awaiting surgery, please first check in with reception before taking the first door on the right after you enter the clinic. Finally, in the event that you feel disappointed with any of the services we have provided or have any further questions, please locate our manager's office, which can be found near the office for medical records and between two closets. If you have any more questions about the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, please do not hesitate to contact us on 01256 111111. Topic 7. Talking about a lecture on the influence of light. 
Jane, what did you think of Professor Morgan's lecture? I don't know about you, but I find it incredibly difficult to believe that light influences the environment as much as he says. I've never seen any journal articles, websites or anything that verifies his arguments. It's stupid. On the contrary, I've seen a great deal of research supporting his argument from a wide range of renowned scientists. Have you looked at the recommended textbook listed on the course outline given to us at the beginning of the semester? All the information is in there. Perhaps you've just been looking in the wrong places. I never look at the course outlines. I have so many loose sheets of paper I tend to lose anything I'm given by the end of the day. What's the textbook they recommend? And where can I get it from? I should probably go buy it soon. I'm already behind in the course. Yeah, you definitely should buy it. And our grades are more important this year. It's called The Influence of Light on the Environment. You should be able to find it in the bookshop on campus. If not, they'll order it within two weeks. In the meantime, you should read up on Ken Simpson's work. He argues that in order to protect natural habitats, governments should endeavour to turn off lights in cities at night. Well, that's controversial. I doubt any government would be willing to do that any time soon. I imagine roads would become quite dangerous without street lighting. For this issue, Dave Kepler suggests they could just replace the existing lights with more environmentally friendly bulbs. They could even install solar-powered lights. That way, roads will be more eco-friendly while maintaining safety. Although I guess they wouldn't be particularly effective in colder countries, especially during the winter. That's quite a good idea, actually. The price of solar power is supposed to be on par with electricity within the next few decades, and it was on the news this morning. I've also heard that, according to Sharon Gray, in countries with more sunlight, insect-eating animals tend to be smaller in size. Since there are fewer insects, and the remaining insects produced a smaller number of eggs. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that sunlight also has a negative effect on the quality of water, but I'm not sure I believe it. In many hot countries, particularly developing countries, there is a lot of water pollution caused by factories rather than sunlight. Nevertheless, Maria Jackson says that in direct sunlight, the surface of the water becomes more translucent. Therefore, it affects the amount of sunlight that aquatic insects can absorb. Not much research has been undertaken to prove Jackson's theory, but it seems to have been widely accepted anyway. I've never heard of that. I'll have to look it up on Google. The only other theory I've studied is Barbara Swallow's study on how declined insect population adversely affects the frog population. Not that I'm complaining, I hate insects, especially spiders. You have arachnophobia? I never would have guessed. Didn't your brother have a pet black widow spider? Yes, he did, and I hated it. It escaped from its cage once, and we never found it. I had nightmares for months. OK, now I'm getting goosebumps. Let's change the subject. What's your stance on natural and artificial light? Honestly, I'm not sure it makes much difference which one you use. Species will die out either way. I think the real argument we should consider is global warming and protection or replacement of finite fuels. Solar power provides us with an incredible opportunity to replace electricity, and governments should definitely increase spending on research in this field. The theories discussed in our lectures like Simpsons and Greys, are so vague and lack proof, so I don't understand why we even study them. I see what you mean. I don't like learning unsupported theories for exams, and I'd rather spend my time learning something else. For example, I'd be much more interested in studying the animals in safari parks than researching migratory birds, particularly the effect of tourists on the quality of life of animals. As we know, 
Every year, thousands of visitors will drive in their own vehicles or ride in vehicles provided by the facility to observe freely roaming animals. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Especially those animals living in more tropical countries like Borneo. Following on from that, I want to study how bringing animals over from foreign countries to put in our zoos affects their life expectancy. For example, do you remember when China sent pandas to Edinburgh Zoo? Apparently, one of the pandas became depressed, but it was never explained why. To me, obviously, you can't take an animal out of its natural habitat and put it in a cage on the other side of the world. It just doesn't work. Topic 8. The History of Football in the UK Great Britain is often hailed as the home of football, with talented players travelling from far and wide to play for teams in the English Premier League, one of the most popular football leagues on the planet. Today we are going to take a look back to the 19th century Great Britain, in an attempt to trace the evolution of the beautiful game, as it is now known. Prior to the 19th century, the game featured a wide variety of local and regional adaptations which were later smartened up and made more uniform to create our modern-day sports of association football, rugby football and Ireland's Gaelic football. Even up to the mid-19th century, Shrovetide football or mob football was still widely practiced. According to the rules of mob football, there were no rules a player could legally use any means whatsoever to obtain the ball, such as kicking, punching, biting and gouging, with the only exceptions being murder and manslaughter. These games may be regarded as the ancestors of modern codes of football, and by comparison with later models of football, they were chaotic and had few cooperation. Towards the latter end of the 19th century, and moving into the early part of the 20th century, however, there appeared a newfound emphasis on moral values in football. Perhaps a more modern example of this can be seen in John Terry's suspension as England captain, following reports of his infidelity to his wife. Furthermore, as mob football died away, there grew a greater concern for players' health and general well-being with many clubs affording their top players access to frequent medical checkups and treatment. Despite the presence of Great Britain's unique, state-funded National Health Service, football clubs are still seen today, providing team members with state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, with the top clubs even housing their own specialist doctors and physicians. Today, football is a key feature of school children's day-to-day -day education, particularly for boys. With the help of football associations, all schools in the UK are boasting their own football teams. This mainly comes as a result of pressure put on schools and the government by concerned parents, who felt that football education taught their children valuable lessons and indeed vital life skills, such as teamwork and a drive to succeed. Nowadays, many of the UK's top football clubs provide training facilities and outreach programmes in an attempt to educate the nation's aspiring youths. As I previously mentioned, it was only during the 19th century that football in its uniform concept truly began to emerge with footballers previously playing according to their own versions of the rules. However, it was not until the early 20th century that different players actually began to play according to these standardised rules. Prior to the 19th century, football was played by all the major English public schools, including the likes of Eton College, Winchester College and Harrow. In 1848, 
there was a meeting at Cambridge University in an attempt to lay down the laws of football. Present at the meeting were representatives of each of these major public schools, whom each brought a copy of the rules enforced by their own individual school's rules of football. The result of the meeting was what is now known as the Cambridge Rules, thereby uniting the rules from across the country into one simple document. However, the Cambridge Rules were not liked by all, and a new set of rules, Thring's Rules, compounded in the book The Simplest Game, became commonplace among dissenters. Across the country, improvements in infrastructure and public transport had a knock-on effect of dramatically increasing attendance to football games. Football quickly became a social event where spectators would meet friends, drink tea and chat about the good old days. As football became more and more popular, it was decided that more money should be invested in maintaining the quality of pitches amongst other things and there was even talk of installing seating for spectators. However, the question of who was to foot the bill quickly became a divisive issue, with many believing that the government should fund football's development as a national sport. But in the end, the onus fell upon Britain's local and regional football clubs for the funding and development of the Football Association. They became responsible for the upkeep of football grounds, began to pay their best players a small salary, and organised competitions against other local and regional teams. And there began England's Football Association, or the FA, as we know it in its current form, the governing body of football in England. As the FA continued to grow and accumulate greater wealth, it was able to attract more and more talented young men from across the country, before finally accepting professional talent in the early 20th century. Today, football is played at a professional level all over the world. Millions of people regularly go to football stadiums to follow their favourite teams, while billions more watch the game on television or on the internet. <laughs>